Now, I'm going to talk today about another aspect of communism, and a lot of you probably won't even think this is communism, but it's certainly part of the world revolutionary movement. In May this year, a young man, Coleman Blevins, was arrested by the FBI, allegedly on his way to stage a mass shooting at a Walmart. Now, that case hasn't gone to court yet, so I can't say the man was guilty or not as charged. But looking at this picture here, I see something of concern. Now, I want you to look uh, to the man's right. There's a picture of a, a circular picture, like an, an iconic thing. It's a circular motif. Now, I want you to take a look at the manifesto of Brenton Tarrant. This is the man who killed 51 Muslims on attacks at two mosques in my hometown of Christchurch, New Zealand, on March 15th, 2019. Do you see a similar motif here? What is this symbol? This symbol is national Bolshevism. It's a movement in Russia, and it's a, a crazy sort of symbiosis of Nazism and communism. National Bolsheviks, they, they say they're the left wing of the Nazi movement and the right wing of the communist movement. And what they're aiming to achieve is a worldwide white socialist republic stretching all across Russia, Europe and the Northern Hemisphere. National Bolshevism. Now, you probably haven't heard of it, but you may have heard of a man called Alexander Dugan, who it's often identified with. Alexander Dugan was a former advisor to Sergei Narishkin, who was Vladimir Putin's intelligence chief. Dugan is really the man the national Bolsheviks look to for guidance. He is a, the father of Eurasian movement, this mass movement of the white peoples of Eurasia will have the northern hemisphere and the darker peoples will have the southern hemisphere. This is sort of a the philosophy they go by. This is a it combines the, it combines the racial elements of Nazism with the class elements and the anti-Americanism and the anti-capitalism of the con of the communist movement. Vladimir Putin's name is known of course all over the world. The name of Alexander Dugan not so much. But to people in the know, Alexander Dugan, a philosopher and Russian public intellectual, matters because he says what Putin thinks. Joining us now for more on the man who has been called Putin's brain, here's Michael Millerman. He is a PhD student in political science who has co-translated Alexander Dugan's fourth political theory. Michael, it's good to have you on TVO for the first time. Welcome. Thanks. Tell us off the top, why do you think it's so important to know who Dugan is? to understand why Putin is doing what he's doing. Well, it's very important to know who Dugin is because he's Russia's chief ideological mastermind. So officially, Russia doesn't have an ideology. According to the Russian constitution, they're not allowed to have, a, have an ideology. But as you can see, if you listen to Putin's speeches, see what he's doing, they seem to be acting in line with some real idea about Russia's role in history and Russia's place in the world. And the source for those ideas is really Dugin's theory of Eurasianism. Eurasianism. So that underlies Putin's project of a Eurasian Union. It gives him the ideas, the arsenal for understanding Russia as a civilization. And it really informs everything he does that's of interest to the West and not really understood by the West right now. I want to read a quote from Dugan's 1997 book, The Foundation of Geopolitics. He's talking about America here, the main enemy of Russia and the Bolsh national Bolshevik movement, the Nat Bowls, as they call themselves. It is especially important to introduce into internal American activity, encouraging all kinds of separatism and ethnic, social and racial conflicts actively supporting all dissident movements, extremist, racist, and sectarian groups, thus destabilizing all internal political processes in the United States. Now, have you seen any of that going on in the last few years in America? This, this balkanization, this separatization, this, the ethnic and social conflict that we've seen in the United States. What could this possibly have to do with national Bolshevism? Well, Branton Tarrant, in his manifesto, about 74 pages long, and by the way, this manifesto is banned in New Zealand. It, they classified it under the Indecent Publications Tribunal. You know, what is normally, res they use laws normally reserved for, por for pornography to suppress this document. Last I heard, you could get a a 10 year, you could get a severe jail sentence and a fine of up to $100,000 just for possessing it. 
Why would New Zealand's Marxist-led government want to so heavily suppress this document? Tarrant was a huge embarrassment to New Zealand. He murdered 51 people in one of our major cities. You know, I used to drive past those two mosques on a regular basis. I knew people who knew people who were killed in those mosques. This was a pretty horrible event. But just as a little aside on this, the first mosque was about a mile from the central police station. Branton Tarrant shot that place up for over 20 minutes, killed over 40 people, and not one policeman turned up. Not one cop, and there was about 200 of them less than a mile away at the central police station. That shows you what giving up your gun rights does, because New Zealand really doesn't have much gun rights at all. You know, just imagine if one of those Muslims, or two, or three, or four of those people in that mosque had been carrying concealed weapons. A, the shooting probably never would have happened, because Branton Tarrant wouldn't have gone into a target um, that he knew where he knew people were armed, and B, if he had been crazy enough to do it, he would have been taken out pretty darn quickly, and the death toll would have been much lower. But that's an aside, because in his manifesto, Branton Tarrant makes it very clear he is not the Trump supporter that our government tried to betray him as. The whole narrative was this is a crazed, right-wing, white supremacist, Trump supporter who just hated Muslims. Branton Tarrant is a lot more sophisticated than that. He's a very intelligent man. Extremely disturbed, I would say, but very intelligent at the same time. And he, he really worked it out in his... In his um, manifesto. He made it very clear that communist China was the nation he admired the most. He has been to North Korea. He's been to Russia. He made it very clear he did not like President Trump at all. And all of these things run counter to the narrative that was spun across the world. So I think that's probably why our left-wing government wants it suppressed. But Tarrant made some very good points. What he, what he said was this. He chose guns to do the killings rather than a bomb or some other method because he wanted to spark the gun debate in the United States. He wanted the left to use the massacre as an excuse to take away the guns from the people. And then the right would refuse to give up their guns and America would devolve into a civil war, especially on racist lines. That would have two impacts, according to Tarrant. A, the whites would separate, you'd have a white republic set up in the north of the United States, and B, the civil war would take America out of the picture internationally so that effectively Russia could then dominate the world. So this was a pro-Russian operation. You know, this man has, has national Bolshevik pro-Dugan symbols on his literature. He clearly hates the United States. He had talks about how he used to be a communist, then he became an anarchist, and then he became a fascist. He is anti-American and pro-Russia. And he did this particular thing to basically spark a civil war in the United States. Read the document yourself if you don't believe me, if you can get hold of a copy. And of course, if you're in New Zealand, it's illegal to do so. I'll go from here to another incident, the famous Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Now, that was a debacle. You had Unite the Right people marching in the streets, being attacked by communists and anarchists. You had a young woman was killed by a guy who drove into a, drove into a crowd of people with his car. Um, two policemen were killed in a helicopter crash associated with the rally. It was a complete debacle. And President Trump and his conservative supporters got the blame. But that's not how it really went down. Now we need to understand the so-called right-wingers who are closely associated with this event were people like Richard Spencer, Matt Heimbach, even David Duke. Now, my contention is this. Those Unite the Right people were pro-Russian and they were fighting in the streets with pro-Russian communists from groups like the Party for Socialism and Liberation, etc. 
most of the American left is still pro-Russia. Communist parties pro-Russia, the Freedom Road Socialist Organizations pro-Russia, Workers' World Party is pro-Russia, Party for Socialism and Liberation is pro-Russia. Even Democratic Socialists of America, which is heavily involved, works very closely with the German Left Party. Die Linke, which used to be the East German Communist Party, which is militantly pro-Russia even to this day. 